Hello, darkness, my old friend. Oh, geez, we got Ojama's taking up a huge part of the changes. Let's just get this over with. So now that Deck Doctors is reaching an end and the Destruction Derby is creeping slowly upon us, I decided that we do one more Doctor's Notes before we send these cards careening into the meta. I guess that means the custom card server has been working overtime in order to approve these cards, right? Not exactly. See, I've had a bit of a falling out with Imaginary Industrial Illusions, as shortly after the last episode, they not only changed the rules yet again to make it almost impossible to get Legacy support approved at all, but they also purged the archetypes that I had already gotten approved from their library, which I can't even get re-approved due to the new rules. I'd still recommend checking them out if you want to have a unique custom card experience with some actual restraint in card design. And I'm still gonna be active on the server, if for nothing else, than for the missions they run on occasion. However, if I want a custom card server of my own material, it appears that I'm gonna have to suck it up and start one of my own. At least it gives me a use for my currently pointless Discord server. I just got it set up for this purpose, so special thanks to Kieran for helping me with all the technical stuff. Regardless, all this means that I'm gonna have to do a lot of serious self-policing in order to fix these support cards. I'm gonna be going in no particular order with this one, so let's start with the one you've all been looking forward to, the Charmer support. First things first, let's quote unquote quickly go over the new support that I missed in the video due to them coming out after it was released, starting with their new series of monsters, the Awakened Possess. Kind of a redundant name, I must say, but I don't have time to grammar Nazi this shit. Raidenari Fire, Rasenryu, Gagigo Bite, and Archfiend Reaper of Nefariousness seem to be Konami's attempt at combining everything Charmer related into a single set of cards. They have basically the same summoning conditions as the Familiar Possess, albeit a bit more restrictive as they need specifically a level 4 or lower monster of their respective attribute to be summoned, with the trade-off of not requiring any specific spellcaster for its other material. Upon being summoned this way, they they each simulate their respective spiritual art cards by activating a watered-down version of said effects. Of these four, only Reaper improves on the effect, as while it does negate the effects of the monster it summons, it's not restricted to Earth monsters, making it significantly more versatile. Gagigobite would probably be second best here, as it at least makes up for the minus used to summon it, if it's special summoned from the deck. And while Rasenryu can be used at least for spot removal and potentially also make up for its minus if it's bouncing an extra deck monster, Inari can't even boast that much since it only burns the opponent for amount of damage that's entirely dependent on the opponent to work. In addition to the above, they also have a floating effect where they can search out a possessed spell trap or their respective spiritual art cards from the deck. If it wasn't for Phantom Rage introducing Rasenryu and Gagigobite to the series, I would have flown off the handle for that last part as the structure deck only included Inari and Reaper, meaning that they were going out of their way to support two of the worst spiritual art cards. Even taking the water and wind ones into account though, the possessed back row search is still far more important. And to Konami's credit, this is something that will appear more in this review. However, all of this is still reliant on these cards hitting the field in the first place, which is where the big ugly level 5 mark really rears its ugly head. In addition to not synergizing with any of the other members, aside from Medium which had the same problems, it also means that they're entirely dependent on their summoning conditions to bring them out, meaning that they're inherently a minus one at least. Thank Halakti that they can special summon themselves from the deck because they also don't receive any support from the deck whatsoever as they are neither Charmers nor Familiar Possessed. They don't have 1500 attack and all the generic Possessed support is limited exclusively to spell traps. All in all, they have some potential, and I would recommend a few of them, but overall I really don't see a point in any of these cards existing. Now onto the spell traps, of which there's actually quite a few to go through. Starting with the one I mentioned in the video, Grand Spiritual Art Ichirin is their field spell, and it's... okay. 
It inherently negates the first monster effect activated by your opponent each turn without chaining, which is certainly nice when dealing with hand traps, though it still requires having one of the spellcasters on the field in order to do so. The second effect gives you a mulligan by shuffling one of your familiar possessed back into the deck while maintaining hand advantage but the search it offers to maintain said advantage isn't especially helpful as the monsters it's meant to support still need more setup in addition to the normal summon in order to be useful. However, that mulligan is still good enough on its own and close to how the deck is meant to be played that it's worth gaining a bit of empty advantage for it. Plus, it's not like there's no way to take advantage of the search, as we'll see with this next card. Masters of the Spiritual Arts is a fantastic card, even though it's yet another card that fucks with the Spiritual Arts archetype definition. The discard is good at getting Nefarious Mouthful into the graveyard where it's meant to be, and even if you don't have the perfect card to discard, getting a double search is more than worth the effort, especially since one of those searches is going straight to your field face down. On top of that, the fact that it searches both Charmers and Possessed back row means that you have access to whatever you would need in any given situation. It also searches familiar Possessed monsters, but for the life of me I can't understand why. Nearest I can figure is meant so that you can use Ichirin's mulligan effect in order to search one of the familiars, but again they're almost dead in your hands so that's not something which I can say in terms of positives for the card. Still, the fact that it can search out the other two is still phenomenally good, so running any less than three is ludicrously stupid. Lastly, we have Teamwork of the Possessed, which is a pretty good utility card, all things considered. It provides some much-needed revival for your spellcasters, both face-up and face-down. The former of which is important because it also serves as some decent spot removal should you have a wide variety of attributes on the field, which also serves to highlight the insanity of the recent members, as they've been decidedly steering away from multi-attribute support until now. However, the graveyard effect is still leagues better as it instantly lets you recycle the continuous cars, which is the closest thing to a win condition that the archetype currently has. It also places them face up on the field, giving you immediate access to their effects and doesn't even banish them when they leave the field, so you're free to recycle them again if you have more copies of this card in the graveyard. It's even immune to the mandatory trap card bashing, as masters can easily search it on a quick effect, and being a trap card also makes its graveyard effect spell speed too, so it can also be used reactively in order to protect your board from whatever's coming your way. Again, run three of these. While I'm at it, a quick shout out to Ada the Sun Magician, who is so clearly designed to be support for this deck that it's a wonder why she's not a member to begin with. So with all this new support, I suppose the question now is whether or not I would still make the Charmer support had I known about these at the time of writing. To which my answer would have to be... Well, yeah, of course I would. As great as these cards are for the archetype, the deck was still miles behind what it needed to be in order to be even playable, so it's still not nearly enough to make them good. On top of that, none of the support addressed what the deck actually needed in order to be more consistent, a reliable way to manipulate and control the attributes of the monsters on the field so that the charmers can actually do something. That being said, I did have to make some significant changes in order to accommodate the new support. For starters, Library is now a continuous spell, something you probably picked up in the last episode. But this does make it recyclable with teamwork, so you can also maintain your win condition easier. It also had its on activation effect changed to search spellcasters with 1500 defense instead of possess spell traps. The reason for this should be obvious, there's more than enough of that now anyway. But it also allows the deck to utilize Ada a lot easier since they can now search her out when they need it. In a similar vein, I also made the same change to Joyous Paramore in that it can't be used to search Possessed Spell Traps with its effect either, but it already has enough on its own that I didn't feel inclined to replace it with anything. While we're on the subject though, let's address the archetype definition of the Spiritual Art archetype since KOA fucked it up. I decided to leave it as is for the time being since I wanted the focus to be on the trap cards to begin with, so I didn't change any of that for this card or for the continuous effect of Dispossess. I did however update it for the activated effect by allowing it to search out Ichirin and Masters by calling out those cards by name. 
If KOA decides to fix this when we get the new support stateside, I'll be more than happy to update this, but until then I have no idea how that's going to work, so this will have to do in the meantime. And that does it for Charmers. As for the rest, the next one which had a new member between this and the last Doctor's Notes is BLS, which I didn't think I'd have to come back to in this series. But before that we have to address Toon Blackluster Soldier, even though I'm sure that most of you can figure out what I'm going to say for yourself. Yes, this is a great boss monster that almost single-handedly makes tunes playable, but it's really not something that can be used outside of a tune deck due to an over-alliance on other tune monsters. Therefore, in terms of Blackluster Soldier support, this doesn't do jack shit. Moving on, the only actual change I made to this archetype was one which I should have made to begin with, in that I changed the materials for Chaos Dragon Master Knight. I realized that going out of my way to include the Dragon of Armageddon as a fusion material was stupid as it was specifically intended to not be a part of the archetype, much like the others of its series. I say this knowing full well that the new material still includes him, as it now requires any Dragon-type Chaos monster. This still includes the Chaos Emperor Dragons as before, but also includes Levianir, Chaos Ruler, the Blue Eyes Rituals, and any Dragon Type Number C monsters due to their Japanese name being Chaos Number. Another card that this includes is Chaos Dragon Master Knight himself, meaning that you can use a copy of this card to bring out another if you want to stack your Banish Zone, which is unintentional but should be fine for now, especially since I also changed it to a proper contact fusion that can't use its materials from the graveyard, making it both easier and harder to bring out at the same time. Moving on to the next archetype, we have Arcana Force taking up most of the changes to the support by far. This was easily my most unbalanced wave, which I attribute to it being among the earliest, so it stands to reason that it would need the most changes in order for it to be balanced. First, let's cover the card which a lot of the changes in the support stems from. As in, let's cover the colossal slap to the nuts that Konami gave me and every other player who wanted to see something good come from this archetype. Arcana Reading has to be the most stubborn insistence on keeping the high-risk, low-reward design philosophy they could have possibly done for this archetype. If you get the coin toss right, you get to search out any card with a coin tossing effect, which not only includes any Arcana Force monster, but also staples like Light Barrier and Second Coin Toss, so it gets a pass on that regard. If you get it wrong, however, you give your opponent what is arguably the best effect in the entire game aside from literally winning the duel. Being able to search anything and everything is such a ludicrously good effect that it's usually locked behind stupidly impossible activation conditions. So if you end up giving your opponent this one for free, you may as well just scoop right there. I suppose that means the opponent isn't going to ash this since it could end up benefiting them ridiculously well, but do you really want to take that risk just so you can potentially get an uninterrupted search? It lets you bypass the coin toss if you have Light Barrier on the field, which is nice since it also works if the latter happens to negate itself, but good luck getting to your Light Barrier with that limited terraforming since the only other way to search it is this card, all but ensuring that you have to risk the entire game on turn 1. At the very least, it also has a graveyard effect to give you a free double summon, but that's still not enough to make up for the abysmal tails effect, so the game is still entirely dependent on getting heads on this thing. The worst thing about it is that the deck has no choice but to run this, as this is still the only consistency boosting card in the entire archetype, so the entire deck still revolves around this one card, much to the dismay of everyone wanting to actually play this deck. Regardless, this is still the reality we live in, so we still have to make a few accommodations for it. First of all, the Arcana reading that I had designed cleverly and intelligently has been dropped from the support, since we apparently can't have nice things. Though admittedly, the artwork on that particular one was abysmal enough that I'm not too sad about it. It's not gone completely though, as the Tails effect has been modified and absorbed into Blessing of the Priestess, since that card's old effect was basically a non-randomized version of the IRL reading, which I can't in good conscience keep around when Konami is this insistent on keeping the archetype terrible. 
I also ended up cutting Flow of the Arcana due to the double summon effect also being present on reading, though once again I was able to salvage its passive effect of tribute summoning Arcana Force monsters with one less tribute. I decided to put this on the monster effect of the sun since I later realized that there was a disconnect with it and Judgment's effect, so that had to be replaced either way. Speaking of the sun, this is one of the four cards that I ended up having to change their tails effects in order to make them more of a win-loss gamble effect. The sun was changed so that the tails effect gave the opponent 500 life points each time a coin toss is performed, and the hierophant has been changed so that the opponent gets to draw and discard one card. These are both negative effects that can easily hinder the player, but they're still nowhere near the give your opponent a free Nibiru levels of bad that reading brought. The other two, being the Reaper and Justice, had their effects changed so that they only affect you as opposed to both players, since their effects were so perfect to what the Arcanum they were based on meant that I couldn't bring myself to change them outright. Speaking of the Reaper, I also had to adjust some of the scales of this archetype in order to favor level 7 and lower monsters to avoid super consistent world locks. Thus, both this card and the tower had their scales reduced to 8 in order to prevent Pendulum summoning level 8 monsters. As for Wheel of Fortune, it keeps the conditional scale 9, though it does reverse the effects. Zero now treats the coin tosses as heads, and nine treats them as tails. This means that even though it can let you pendulum summon the world, it will always have its abysmal tails effect unless Light Barrier is also on the field. As for the other level eight in this archetype, Judgment is arguably the single most unbalanced card I ever made in Deck Doctors, so it stands to reason that it was going to need some serious nerfing. First and foremost, its passive effect blanket negates the effects of all fiend monsters as opposed to only your monsters, but it also doesn't turn them into massive double attacking beast sticks either, so its tails effect isn't an alternate win condition either. Additionally, the heads effect only works on level 7 or lower arcana force monsters, so there's no cheating out the world that way either. Hopefully that should be enough to balance the card somewhat while still keeping the spirit of the card, which was kind of important for the series. Lastly, the counter trap has received a significant makeover as it now requires a level 8 or higher Arcana Force monster in order to be used, and is now an Omni Negate as opposed to only stopping spell traps. But it's tied to a coin toss where heads negates the effect and tails banishes all monsters you control. Like with reading, it can be bypassed with Light Barrier, but it still keeps in the theme of the deck and can also be searched with reading, so it's not a total loss either. And now that we're done with that monstrosity, let's go ahead and move on to the other one, that being Ojamas. I still maintain that Arcana Force is the most unbalanced wave of support I've ever made, but Ojamas are still a pretty close second. I suppose that's what I get for blindly following Kieran's instructions on this, but still. First of all, both Arm Dragon and Inferno Roar have been deleted, the latter because it's not even close to Ojama support, while the former was just a little too generic for its own good. I also ended up cutting Ojamandala and Delta Barrage that they were just a little too powerful for the game to be used. I tried fixing Barrage to make it a bit more balanced, but it ended up being more trouble than it was worth, especially since the Ojama retrains now exist. Speaking of which, I had to nerf the retrains quite significantly, as they were just a tad too good on their own. First of all, they only changed their name on the field and in the graveyard, not in the deck, meaning that they can't be searched with Oja Magic and lets the original vanillas exist in the same deck as them. Their negation effects no longer destroy the card they negate, which was actually a bit of an oversight on my part since they were supposed to do that originally. But they also require you to control specifically the other two original Ojamas or their respective retrains in order to work, making them much less generic in that regard. In addition to all of this, their floating effects now only work if they're sent from the hand, banish themselves as costs, and only recycle cards from the graveyard instead of searching from the deck. Overall, they're a lot less powerful, but they still accomplish what they were meant to do. The last change involves Ojama Jack, their new Link monster. It now puts a hard lock on the extra deck of any player who wants to use any of this card's effects, preventing them from summoning any non-Ojama monster from their extra deck. 
This helps curb both link spam and ABC Ojama significantly, so this was very much necessary in this new wave of support. The only reason why it's on this card in particular is because it was the one that had both the room to accommodate it and the utility to incentivize using it despite the lock. If it ends up still being a problem, I may distribute this effect further, but for now it should be fine where it is. For the third episode in a row, we have entities making an appearance on Doctor's Notes, with Call being deleted since it was no longer necessary now that Trapezohedron is viable once again. Additionally, I also ended up cutting the entire Deep Entity engine, as it ended up being an infinite loop machine that the deck ultimately didn't need. Additionally, I changed Yig's effect once again so that his Poly Search effect now requires another entity on the field in order to go off since a generic synchro with a free poly search was just a little too generic. Karibos also had a couple of changes. Curry Bethany is now immune to all card effects, including your own, meaning that it can't get the attack boost from Village. Since I realized a 3300 beat stick that's completely immune to everything was just a little too good no matter how difficult it is to summon. Additionally, Rainbow Blessing no longer becomes spell speed 4 with Rainbow Karibo since it turned out to be a bit too consistent and unfair of a win condition. Editing PT Devil here with a last minute change for Celtic Guard. It's been brought to my attention that I needed to quickly change the graveyard effect of Sacred Blades, the ritual monster, as it turned out to be way too generic for its own good. Having an Omni negate for any deck with a foolish burial is just asking for trouble, so I decided to adjust the requirements so that it requires you to control Celtic Guardian in order to activate and resolve this effect. Lastly, we have Reptilians, with Sibaris' self-zeroing on its special summoning now affecting its original attack, which is effectively the same thing. And its level drop effect now works with any Reptilian in your hand, as opposed to only tuners, meaning that it can make Skink a lot easier with any level 4 in your hand. And with that, we're finally done with all the changes. I'm sure with my luck there's still a few issues that I'm too stupid to see, but I won't know about it until I actually see these bad boys in actions. This means that I'm going to call this as the last episode until the Deck Doctor's Destruction Derby is done. The next video will be the official tournament announcement, so keep an eye out for that, and I look forward to seeing you in the rankings. Until then, thank you for watching, and until next time, don't get run over, and I'll see you guys later.